Good afternoon everyone, welcome to 2021. Thank goodness 2020 is out the way and I don't know about you but I feel very positive about this year even though Howard, I'm just about to introduce you, <laughs> we're in lockdown again. We are indeed, yes. Yeah. Happy New Year everybody and happy lockdown. <laughs> lockdown three. Yeah. So delighted you can kick off the series. This is the third series of the Crowdcast, the Firefish Crowdcast, and um, this is Howard Greenwood, everyone. Um, lots of experience to share, so I think this is a, a really good time to be kicking off this week, because as we do go into lockdown, I'm sure lots of our audience will be sort of going, OK, how's this going to affect us? What's going to be happening? So I'm, I, you know, I'm looking forward to the next half an hour with you. But Howard, you have lots of experience, director of Computer People, Adeco, Evolution, Robert Half, Larson Group, and you, you know, you've been um, helping out Rec and App School. So hugely qualified in this industry, lots of things to share. Um, and you know, your your current role right now is you've just kicked off a new business last year. Um, called the Jump Consultancy. So hats off to you there, which I know um, lots of uh, businesses have been really benefiting from your help and guidance last year. So interesting to delve into some of that and what you've been sharing. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much and Happy New Year, everybody. It's, it's been a, 2020 for us was a very interesting year, you know, and out of you know, lockdown, we created a new company. And, you know, I think, I keep saying this, if you look for the positives in it, in everything, you'll find positive things. And, you know, we found lots and lots of positives up from 2020 and we'll find a lot more in 2021. And I think, you know, what we've done to sort of try, help grow the recruitment market and stabilise the recruitment market has been really well received. And we're still doing that. You know, every week we're doing lots of webinars, lots of training webinars, lots of business mentoring webinars for for everybody that can just go on for free, they're, they're usually on a Wednesday at 11 o'clock for business uh, webinars. And, you know, we're getting lots of good feedback from the marketplace. And as they tell us, it's about being authentic and actually giving back in times of need, where I think a lot of people are looking for, you know, they're looking for ideas, looking for creativity there. And, you know, I think we said at the beginning of lockdown that, you know, if you leave lockdown with the same mindset that you entered lockdown, you've missed the massive opportunity to really grow and grow your business. We're now in lockdown three and we're still saying the same things, you know, mindset keeps changing and gets better and better. And I think what we've found is the clients that we've been working with, that their mindset has hugely changed from being sort of pessimistic. And I think if you've got a very pessimistic mindset, that you, you miss lots of opportunities where if you're more optimistic about things, then those opportunities appear in front of you. And it's how you take hold of those opportunities, how you capitalize on those opportunities. So I think there's lots of things that we can be proud about from what we've done in lockdown. That's everybody. There's lots of learnings and lots of teaching to be taken from lockdown that we can really sort of grow from. Well, I think that's absolutely good. That's a brilliant summary of where we are. And I think that's where I'm feeling really positive. And I'm sure lots of our audience there. Hi, everybody that's saying hello in the comments. That's brilliant. And um, any questions, pop it in the questions or put it in the comments. I'll be monitoring that and pose that to the questions to to um, to Howard. But, you know, I, I really felt that businesses that I saw progressing had made fundamental changes last year. And so although a lot of business owners and, and recruiters were quite rightly crawling to the end, I know I was one of them there as well, but, you know, you should have been very, everybody should have been really proud of what they actually achieved and went through last year. And really it's about drawing a line on that, using that learning and implementing it this year, I think is really what, what we're looking for. So to start that off, what I thought was a really good topic to start the series off is looking at, um, you know, understanding your experience of managing your teams right now and focusing on your your um your your employees that are coming back and your teammates because it's it's really as if we've understood everything it's about who you're working with that makes you stronger and mm -hmm. and how you actually facilitate that belonging within your companies um you know going forward to make you more successful in 2021 so i'm going to kick off there if that's okay um and sort of really look at um you know what does a successful team in your opinion, right now, look like to get the most out of 2021? What, what should people be looking for? So I think it's a really interesting sort of question. And I think it leads down so many different avenues. And I think what makes an interesting team a, a powerful team is one that's genuinely united. And to be united, you have to all, everyone understand the vision and the mission that the business is actually moving on. And a well-run business you know, strategy is to sort of look at your people, look at your strategy, look at your execution of your strategy, 
and then to look at the cash that that produces and how each individual part of that strategy interlinks with everybody else. So if you looked at, say, your strategy, what effect does that have on your people? And when I talk people, I'm talking about the employees, your clients, your candidates, your suppliers. So everything that you do has an effect on that and it will all have an effect on cash. So if we look at the people first and foremost, you know, if you look after your people and they'll look after your clients and look after your candidates and that way they'll start to look after your business. So it's what are you doing to your people and how are you motivating your people? And I think there's that leadership needs, that moral backbone that has the ability to aspire and inspire, you know, the people to actually become better than what they are and you know one of the things that I've always said about what recruitment is always been poor about is the actual well-being of each individual member within that team and I think I'll, I'll sum that up by saying you know the usual recruitment methodology was here's some training when you start whether it be one day two day two weeks and then it is sink or swim and off you go and you never get very much training after that from that point of view where if you look at any successful team, they're training constantly, they're developing constantly. So all of those sort of things, when you start to think about your recruitment processes, how they, what effect do they have on your people? And it's interesting, you know, as a CRM provider, you must hear this all the time, that you know, people don't use the CRM, they don't use that, et cetera. And I, I'm always saying, well, it's why aren't they using the CRM? It's because they don't understand what value it gives to them or how they've been trained to use the CRM to get the most out of that process. And once they understand what they're getting out of it and the value that it gives them, then they engage with it. And I think that's the same with training them. It's the same with understanding the mission. When we go into clients, we start talking about the advisory thing. The first thing we ask is, do you understand your own values and your own mission? And the business owners sometimes don't understand their own values and their own mission. And we say, well, if you don't understand it, how does your team understand it? We then talk about the team and say, right, does your team understand the mission and the values that you have? And so, generally, no. So, because that's a that's a good topic there in terms of vision and value. I'm going to pick that up in, in a little bit, step because that was there was a lot of good stuff there, Howard. I'm going to unpick that a little bit, if that's okay. Because yeah, yeah. Right. I think what you're saying there is looking at what are your goals for the business, and then driving that into how do you know what roles do the company, you know, each person play in order to then deliver that output. Yes. Yeah. I think and, yeah. and what I, because I, I can really relate to that as well, because I think, you know, in a recruitment company, you know, a lot of people are doing individual desks and they ha mm -hmm. are responsible for their individual sort of area and figure and target. But actually, I think what we felt last year is that a company to be of great strength has to work together and, and actually look at the different roles for the different areas, you know, within cross-functional tasks. And there are things like, you know, who's looking after the website, who's looking after the marketing, who's looking after different tasks rather than just recruitment, who owns candidates, whose responsibility is it for that? So I, I think really what you're saying there is really to get an understanding of the roles that each person plays that would then help to form that belonging. Is that the case? So it's all about accountability to the process. So what you tend to find is, you know, recruitment's got that bad name about the attrition problem of revolving doors of people coming through. And I always find that, you know, when I speak to clients and they say, you know, you know I'm hiring bad people. I'm saying you can't be hiring bad people. It's a bad process that leads to the person that you're hiring and then the process that you're doing. So people need to be accountable for the process. So if you're looking at your process, if your process isn't delivering the right results, review your process, look to improve your process. And that means training and developing your staff on that process and how that works. So whatever the process is, and if you, if you lined up all the processes that you do from cradle to grave in recruitment, there's hundreds of processes, find out which ones are working and which ones aren't. The ones that aren't are the bottleneck within the business. If you can then sort of free that bottleneck up by either developing the process and changing the process and making it more user friendly, because the reason why people don't use the process is because they generally either don't like it, it's not user friendly, or they don't see the value in it. So once they start to see the value and they start to see how easy the process could be, then all of a sudden things change. So when I've always sort of looked at sort of developing any sort of process, by involving my staff in the development of that process, A, I get to understand what they truly want and what they need, 
and B, they have the input into what they're doing and therefore they feel more accountable for that process and therefore will deliver it with more passion than before rather than something that's enforced on them. So I think as that team bit, that driving passion, energy and purpose becomes really important. But as a leader, what you need to be doing is rather than telling your staff what to do, you need to be asking the questions on how they enjoy doing it. Is it working? Is it not? And I always think it's not finding the right answers. You've got to find the right questions to ask first to get the right answers. And that's the same as if you're a you know, recruiter selling to candidates and clients, etc. Rather than just going on with the generic questions, if you find the right questions to ask first and foremost, then what you get is you get a better answer at the end of the day, which gives you yards and yards of advantage over your competitors. As a manager, the same thing happens. Rather than telling consultants what to do, if you ask them what they're doing and then work out what's working and, and what's and, working. And, and even to add to that as well, because we went through a very long process with our business as well as why is somebody doing it? Why are you doing that? You know, it's amazing when uh, you, you find out how, how, I'm sure you must have done this in your businesses as well. It's like how many people were just doing tasks for the sake of tasks because they've always done them. Yeah. Well, that's that's a word, that's a sentence I've tried to ban in 2020, and I'm, I will definitely ban it in 2020. We've always done it that way. Yeah. Well, you know, Henry Ford built the first Ford car on, the, on his process. If Henry Ford was alive today, you know, he'd be looking at that process and look at the development of that process. So yes, you've always done it that way, but there's always better ways to do things. And I think that's just a lazy person's response, not wanting to grow from a personal point of view and from a business point of view. So having that sort of drive of, you know, be process proud but never satisfied is really important. I think you've got to look at your processes and always look for development. I love that. And I think that's really helpful around where the sort of roles come in place of developing that continuous improvement throughout, you know, a business and, and very much, in it, you know, on point, I think, with a lot of companies. And we've got this time again, you know, just now to really iron this, you know, iron these things out and get them embedded mm -hmm. in in the businesses as well, which is which is really good. So I'm going to flip that over as well in terms of you touched on well-being. Um, of the staff as well and you know getting to know your staff we are back it's different I, I think you would agree lockdown one lockdown three but um, and I think a lot of businesses were very good at sort of jumping into making sure well I hope they were you know how everybody was doing are you okay at home but and although this is very different in lockdown three as leaders we should and as managers of, of other recruiters you know, we should still be checking in on our employees. Can you talk to me a wee bit about this? How do we get to know our staff when we're on a remote basis? So there's lots of different things that are going to change because we're going to be working in a remote basis for quite some time. Working from home will become the new norm. And whatever anybody says, whether they, they want to be in an office or outside or working from home, you know, that, that is going to be the norm for quite a long time. The, the, you know, the, the virus isn't just going to disappear just because the vaccine's here. You know, we've got to start to think about this is going to be the process for an awful long time. So when we say getting to know your staff and truly getting to know, know your staff, it's a very different thing. So we talk about motivate, what motivates staff. What we want to be talking about is what motivates them from a personal point of view. So from a, you know, about family, about their friends, about their financial implications outside of work. And then how does work interact with that to then motivate them with what's going on? And I always found as a, as a manager, once I got to understand the person and understand what they actually want and what they need from a personal point of view, not from a business point of view, from a personal point of view, then I can motivate them from a business point of view because I can start to try to deliver those things and work those things. So as they're now working from home, you know, I always say that, you know, someone's review, whether it be a weekly, monthly, quarterly, whatever review it is, it's not me reviewing them. It's them reviewing themselves and reviewing me and my capabilities of igniting their passion and their capabilities to come forward. So I think there's a bit of a flip that's sort of come where because we don't see these people every day, we've got to start to work with them. And I think the first thing, right, is are they happy? You know, so if they're having to work at home because they can't get into the office, you know, is that work conducive? You know. I, I, I'll take Dave Pryor as one of my business partners. You know, he's got seven kids. You know, so if you can imagine having seven wow. kids at home, all, all on. No, the... I can't. I cannot imagine having seven kids at home. You know, we, we have this conversation of 
but all on the internet, all trying to do things. So, you know, four are still at school, three have left school, two at university, etc. So they have massive amounts of problems on the internet. So it's how do you ma manage that? You know, it could be the other way around where you're the, you live on your own. You know, how do you, you know, interact with other people? So everyone will have something very different to, for their own personal needs. So I think that mental well-being and health becomes really important. And to me, that should be the first starting point of any review and any conversation. And it's not just how are you, it's how are you today? Mm -hmm. You know, genuinely, how are you today? You know, to try really there. And I think that, you know, the empathy, the sympathy as a manager suddenly becomes a very different thing because you really want to get under the skin of your staff from a personal point of view so you can motivate from a business point of view as well and i think the business part comes second if you get that then all of a sudden you have a very different team a different supercharge because you're helping them and it could be simple things very very simple things and i think the big thing lockdown was given about working from home is that it's given trust and we have to trust people to work from home so, you know, if I was ringing my staff up and they're saying, oh, I'm, I'm doing my weekly shopping at Tesco's and it's midday, I'm not bothered because I'm trusting them that they'll still go back and do the amount of work that's required to what is the standard required from what our expectations that we've set. So it's those type of things that they have that freedom and it's about us trusting them to deliver back the promises that we've given to them by giving them that freedom. And I think that, again, is a big trust issue that managers, you know, I remember speaking to clients before lockdown about you know remote working and everyone was massively against it but all of a sudden it's now here and people are seeing benefits from both sides there's positives and negatives on both of those uh, from working from home but there's massive positives to be had if you manage your staff right and to me that's all about how you embrace your staff's feelings and really look at what they are and generally react to them and that's about managers truly listening to what's being said rather than listening to give the answer that they think they should be giving anyway. Yeah. And and does a guideline, Howard, how you know, because you can also go to the other extreme and check in too many times and then it becomes micromanagement. What are you what are you suggesting that, you know, if there's a manager out there of a recruitment team, what should they be doing? How should they be sort of, you know, how regularly should be the checking in on other team members? So I think there's a couple of things to be had there that, you know, it shouldn't be just the manager. You should almost create a buddy system going on so other people are checking in all the time uh, from there. But also it should be sort of, what you tend to find is that, you know, I remember sort of working with teams. I knew the person that I could, you know, stand up in the middle of the room and go, hey, well done, Wendy, that's absolutely awesome. The whole room turned around, you know, look at you and you're going, yes, you know, accolade. I could do that to somebody else and they'd shrivel up and die because they don't want that sort of outward accolation. But if I drop them an email saying, that's really good, Wendy, that's just as good as the outward accolation. So it's finding how people actually want. So some people might want a check-in every day. Some people might not want that. So you'd have your business check-in, you know, whether that's set standard by the business, and then you'd look at how you do your personal check-in with each individual person. But again, it evolves around what that person wants and how that person is. So you know, whether you're using Zoom, Microsoft Teams, whether you're using you know, whatever system you're using to check in, you know, what it is, it's about that personal invasion of that person's space. And it's about helping them. And I think that's what you've got to remember is that it's you reaching out to them to help them not checking in. If they feel they're being checked in on, then they're just gonna switch. Exactly. And, and Annette, I completely agree. You know, gosh, what we wouldn't have been able to be doing these um, lockdowns if we didn't have the likes of, you know, Microsoft Teams and, and Zoom and, and everything else, because it does, you know, we have a rule in that you we're not phoning anybody. Everybody's just you, 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 you are on video every time you even make a call because you can read so much from just somebody and how they're interacting. So I think that's really important. Um, and I love the fact, you know, the buddy scheme. I think that's a really good thing. We did that in lockdown one. And it's just making sure that, hey, is everybody is everybody well? You know, even over the weekend, they've got somebody to say, hey, I'm not feeling well or anything like that. Then it just shows that, you know, you've got a bit of a support culture there. I think that that's really good. But more, more importantly, gosh, the effect of positiveness and, you know, saying well done and, you know, in, in whatever way that employee 
uh, needs to hear it or, sh or wants to hear it, it, it can just have such a, a good impact, can't it? It has. And I think one of the things that I picked out from here, we, we did a session with a guy called Phil Davis, who's an ex-Welsh rugby international. And before we started the session, Phil and I had spent a long time talking about various different things. We did lots of stuff together outside of work. And I was talking about strengths and weaknesses. And he just turned around and said, there is no such thing as a weakness. And I went, OK, he said, think what you say when you say weakness. What does it instantly conjure in your head? And it conjures everything that's weak and you start to think about weak things. And he says, I use the word gap. So I have strength and gaps, gaps in my knowledge, gaps in my capability. And a gap to me instantly is something that you can bridge, something that you need to get over, etc. So it all has a different sort of mindset all the time. So having that positivity all the time is really you know, interesting. So look at what people do really, really well. Mm -hmm. And I always say, you should praise in public, but address them something in private that's something that they, they're maybe not doing well. So you have that sort of different mindset and stuff like that. Now, when people are working really hard and something might not be going right, it's understanding what they're doing that isn't working. Now, that could be the process that's stopping them. It could be them that's stopping them. And it's releasing that uh, blocker to ignite their potential. And I think that's what it's about. But if you forever focus on weaknesses, all you do is drive people down and sort of batter them down. So you've got to focus on the gap, okay, and reframe it. And that goes back to that questioning rather than telling me you need to do this, you need to do this. It's asking them, what do you think you need to do? How do you think you should do that? How do you think this would improve you? And you get them to give you the answers and you get them to talk about their answers because then all of a sudden they're the person telling them. And they get to that point where they maybe have a stop, then you can add to it from there. But just tell, tell, tell as a manager in this environment is just never going to work because as soon as that phone goes down or the Zoom call goes off, you know, you're in, you, you have no control and that yeah. person will just disappear and, and let their own manifestations of their mindset rule their day. And that's not what you want. You have to create that positive culture of support constantly. And that to me then is about asking the right questions rather than tell them what to do no and, and uh, awesome and i agree with all of that Howard. really really good um now we've had a, a question from andrea green on linkedin which i think is really relevant when we go back to what makes a successful recruitment team for 2021 um because a lot of recruitment teams operate in their own sort of function but what um uh what uh, um andrea was sort of saying is how, how do we really sort of work in you know cross-functional teams so that you're actually putting in the structure. So if you have a larger organization that is doing HR, sales, um, you know, IT, professional services, how, how can you help to put that structure in where they're actually talking to one another out with their own team? Because I think that's been quite, I've seen a lot of success last year with teams doing that. Have you, can you concur with that? And, you know, how have you encouraged people to do that? So I remember taking over an office a long time ago uh, in the early 2000s. And to say the office was at war with itself would be an understatement. So, <laughs> well, that Herm, often is the case, though, isn't it, Howard, in recruitment times? So. Perm hated contract, contract hated perm, <laughs> IT hated, hated finance, finance hated, hated IT. And it was just awful, yeah. really, really, really awful. Until we started to work out that, you know, What's your footprint in that client? How you can introduce somebody into that client? What you can do to dominate a client is a lot different. And it's really sort of encouraging to start to see that once you start to share, and so I, I, I mandated that if a contract consultant was going to visit a client, they must take a perm consultant with them and vice versa. If you were going out to see an IT client and they had a finance function, you must take a finance person with them. All of a sudden, people were coming back with twice as many opportunities. They were getting far more opportunity. So I think it's a case of understanding your client. And I always think that your client has several different levels that we need to be selling at. So if you've got an IT person selling at a, an IT level and a finance person and an HR person selling at their level, above them will be a tier of management. So who's selling at that level? 
And so if you start to layer up your selling and you've got four or five different people then talking to different levels of the business, all of a sudden, at the top end, you're talking business. At the bottom end, you're talking recruitment. All of a sudden, you get to understand the opportunity with the client. Because what you might find is that the difference is your HR person might be saying, well, I've got a really good client here. I'm billing 50 grand a year out of them. The IT person might not be let in for whatever reason and only billing four or five grand. But the IT section might be worth a million pounds. So I love this and this gets me quite excited because how much easier is it to maximize your existing customer base right now than open up a new door, right? Exactly. So this is a big thing that, you know, from a cultural point of view, you've just highlighted it, you know, I, I was part of that as, as well in terms of I, if I got a visit with a client, I would always take a perm, was, my background is contract, always take a perm consultant out and you would then do the cross sell from that. Now that, how can we make that happen? Uh, and and actually facilitate that sort of cross selling internally with successful teams when we're all remote. So there's one question that every recruiter needs to be asking to then ignite that opportunity. So if I was talking to you as a client and I said, Wendy, how much do you spend on recruitment per annum? You would give me an answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how is that sectioned out into the sections of my business? All of a sudden, I might find that. A, on my side of business, I'm missing a load of opportunity. But on HR side, they're missing huge amounts of opportunity. If everyone's sort of having that business structure. And then what you're doing is you're creating a business strategy around the client, not around individuals, then everyone should be having that conversation and everyone should be feeding in. So therefore, it's important that the data that's put onto the database becomes absolutely critical to that client base so having a formula do you know who the ceo is do you know who the cti is do you know who their hr director is do you know how much they spend on recruitment every year do you know who their threats are do you know what's happening who can stop you recruiting in there there's loads and loads of questions that you could tear down and ask those type of questions but if you haven't got all of that on a client plan then how do you develop that client and i can give you a True example, I had a, a team in Nottingham that I took over for a small period of time, and they were part of key accounts. I was always new business, didn't really bother with key accounts. Okay, I took them over because their manager had left, and I asked a simple question, how much did your client spend this year? And they went, well, we've had a great year. We, we did four million pounds. I said, that's great. How much did the client spend on recruitment? Mm -hmm. There's four suppliers in that client. He came back a week later and said, oh my God, they spent 25 million pounds on recruitment we got four. Our major competitor had 16. And that just shows you, doesn't it, when you look at it from a different perspective. I, I, I think this is, we're just coming to the end of our, our sort of allocated time because we could go on and talk about this for, for a lot and it's such a good topic, but relating us back to successful teams, I think you've just sort of given us a you know lovely golden nugget there because it's restructuring some of your communications and, and allocated time in the week to get yeah. together. You know, so I'm listening to that and thinking, gosh, you know what, that could fall into almost like a boot camp learning where each person brings one of their key accounts to that team. And it's everybody, doesn't matter what division, what function or type of recruitment that they're doing. They present that client and saying, hey, this client spends this amount. We've got X percent on, you know, this particular function but I know that there's X amount, how can we work together? And you're building that client plan. So taking it right back to where we started, Howard, you were very clear on how each person's role fits into a process and a systematic yeah. process. Perhaps really where we should be focusing in the next couple of months is building the focus actually on targeting clients and how much additional business that we could actually do as a successful team within that. If you look at it in that way, every person that comes to that table will have an advocate of them within that business. Mm -hmm. and what you're trying to get a client from that trusting part to the loyalty part to advocacy, because once you've got advocacy right across the business, you've got a client for life. But if you've got lots of people, their own little sort of sponsor within the business, you can create mass advocacy very, very quickly. But if you're always working in your own little silo, you'll never create that mass advocacy because you're never actually spreading. Because it could be that, you know, I'm the IT guy, I'm based in London, you're the HR person, you're based in Edinburgh. You might not speak on a regular basis. 
And therefore, you've got to really sort of get that in. Now, it doesn't matter if you're a big client there. You could be a very small client. And you could be thinking, right, okay, I'm doing a reasonable amount of work in that client at the moment, but I need to get more work because my client base is shrinking because of COVID. Well, what can that client introduce you? Who can that client introduce you to? What's that client's need? And that goes back to asking the right questions of the client in the first place. You know, who else can I be speaking to? What else can I be helping you with? What other problems have you got that I can solve that suddenly becomes a very, very different thing? To do, do that properly, it's about the culture of the business. So you could have a reward and recognition, which is about the sale, but you could always put a hard, a big chunk of your reward and recognition about the cultural sharing of that business. Now, all of a sudden, you're driving then, you know, actually activity by the rewards scheme that you're saying, well, if you're not sharing, then you're not going to get all your, your, your rewards or your recognition for that because you're not sharing. If you do share, you'll get more. And so you can start to sort of really drive that mindset by how you reward and recognize people. And it's not just about cash. And it's not just about promotion. It's about other things with inside the business that you can gain. So I think that so, it, this topic, could, we could talk for hours about this yeah. topic. But to me, it's all stemmed with that process. And whatever process you change, what effect does it have on the people, your employees, your clients, your candidates, and potentially your suppliers at the end of the line, you know, what does it have? Your strategy is important. It's the execution of that strategy that then you need to be measuring. And once you measure the execution of that strategy, you can work out what's working, what's not working. And then that leads, and then I always say at this moment in time, people talk about how much am I turning over? Well, I don't care how much you're turning over. You talk about profit. Yes, I care about profit. What I'm more interested in, if you want to grow this year is what cash you've got sat in your bank that you can invest in the growth of your business. So every action that you have and every process that you lead to, does it lead to cash dropping into your line, your cash line, that you can then invest back into the business to help the business grow? And if you start to really think about it in that fashion, you know, people become the most important part of your business. If they don't understand the strategy, understand the strategy, they're never going to deliver that. If they don't understand the strategy, how do they execute it? Howard, I think that's awesome. And that's a really good way. I normally sort of finish up on sort of giving me your top five tips of what you can do right now. But I think we've just covered that. <laughs> <laughs> so because I think that really, uh, if, if companies are, are sort of looking at how to structure maybe their internal communication, being remote and having an output on getting the people together and delivering on those um, sort of target customer plans, you know, checking in and building that structure with their people, then everyone's going to set themselves up for a really, really good 2021. And that's what this series for Firefish is all about, is joining the recruitment dots. So that's the, the title of the series and that's what we'll be doing. Howard, thank you so much for your insight Absolutely. there. I know that our audience um, has, has really enjoyed that. And thank you again also, I see Lucy, You've just posted in a really good video there. Thank you for that in terms of, um, you know, looking at what really motivates that. Don't underestimate this. This is going to be really important for your employees. So definitely um, make sure that uh, although you've got a year of goals in front of you, which I know personally, I can just be focusing on that. You've got to also focus on your people too. And um, so Howard, thank you so much. Um, and next week, so it will be continuing this from all the positive feedback that we had from everybody on last year. We'll be we'll be continuing our fortnightly crowdcast next week. Uh, next fortnight's guest is Jeremy Snell, and he'll be focusing on the sales strategy, opening up new clients, new opportunities. So really important to get that in early in January so that you can set up for February, March, April and get the year off to a good start. Um, so thank you, for everybody, for joining us. Uh, do your usual. If you've enjoyed it, please like this, share it with amongst friends. Um, you know, if it keeps growing the audience, then we'll keep doing this. Uh, and I'll see you in a fortnight. Thank you, Howard. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Wendy. Have a good year.